true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. Sarge is a fascinating memoir by the late Chicago Police Detective Sergeant John A. DiMaggio, one of the most decorated officers on the force during a career that spanned the years 1957 to 1991. Among his awards are two superintendents' awards of valor, Mayor Richard J. Daly's praiseworthy acknowledgement plaque for exceptional act of bravery involving risk of life, a presidential citation of appreciation, the Illinois Police Association Award of Valor, and many more. Upon his retirement in 1991, DiMaggio wrote a fascinating account of his work as a cop. The manuscript languished among his personal effects until after his death in 2008, after which his family decided to resurrect it, spruce it up, and submit it for publication. It turns out that he was an excellent word craftsman and storyteller. In fact, he was no stranger to writing. For many years, he wrote the Ask Sarge column for the Mystery Writers of America Midwest Chapter Newsletter. Told in a conversational, regular guy voice in episodic fashion, Sarge reveals to the reader what it really was like to be a cop. The manuscript in many ways takes the form of a prose treatment of a weekly television police drama. A large selection of photos is included. DiMaggio takes the reader back to the decades such as the turbulent 60s, when the police department was making a painful transition from old school to modernization. The author describes firsthand the legendary riots that occurred in Chicago after the assassination of Martha Luther King Jr. He illustrates the integration of minorities into the department and how that played out. He also goes into famous cases of corruption and the politics of navigating such a large department. One of the set pieces of the book is the story of how DiMaggio as part of the Three Musketeers, a trio that included two detectives who were close friends, investigated a series of terrifying slasher attacks on women that occurred in the city in the mid-70s. The case became one of the police department's most memorable. Among the other cases detailed in the book include how DiMaggio found himself entering the home of a crazed young man holding hostages with a shotgun, the investigation of the discovery of a headless corpse, the takedown of the Chicago Mad Bomber, how an anonymous audio tape provided clues to the identities of armed robbers and the manhunt for a cop killer. The book that we're featuring this evening is Sarge, Cases of a Chicago Police Detective Sergeant in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, with my special guest, attorney Deborah DiMaggio. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Deborah DiMaggio. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I forgot to introduce to the audience your collaboration in this book as collaborator and executive producer and publisher. Let's start off immediately with the genesis of this published book by your father. When was it written? When did he retire? Tell us about some of the details and the genesis of this book, Sarge. He retired in February of 91. His retirement party was a month or two later. And we saw so many people show up to honor him. And then my parents went to Las Vegas, where many Chicago police retire, and they find security jobs in the casinos. So I think my dad worked at a golf course for a little bit and he had some security jobs part time. He was writing this book and it was a memoir and it started out simply focused on the Dominique slasher case. And he visited the prison and obtained an interview. And in the book, he quote unquote said he was fascinated by the criminal mind. And this case got to him. And I think he wanted to understand the reason for those crimes and perhaps humanize the perpetrator on some level, not thinking or saying he should be released, but to simply understand him, the why. So after 
my father's death in 2008, my brother shipped all of the manuscripts to me. And being the lawyer in the family, they thought I might have some contacts. So I would mention it here and there. And organically, I met an entertainment lawyer. I met a screenwriter. And interestingly enough, the screenwriter, his career, he went into making horror films because of the book, Three Boys Missing, Mm. which was another crime on the Northwest side. And it was very highly unusual for crime in that area. And then we met down the line, Raymond Benson, who is an acclaimed author with more than 40 books and was hired by Ian Fleming for the Bond series to author a book, some of their novels. And I know that my dad had some help from Wayne Platt, so he should be given some credit. So we wound up getting Crossroad Press. They were interested. I got a message the day after my birthday. We'd be honored to publish your dad's book. And here we are. Now, when was this book launched? October of 2018. Now, before we start, we're going to talk about the Robert Robert Dominique case. And we're going to talk about another case of the Valerie Percy murder. Let's talk about the book launch and who shows up at the book launch. We had the book launch and I stayed in touch with one of the victims who will remain anonymous. And my dad used anonymous fake name in the book. And I asked their permission to have the book published. And they said that your dad was our hero and anything he wanted, we want. And I don't think they ever listened to the tape. I'm not sure if they read the book, but they attended the book launch and remained anonymous to the crowd that showed up family and friends. You write that you always knew your father was a cop, but in the writing and, well, the publishing of this book and the collaboration and getting it all together for publication, what did you learn in that regard? I learned what he was doing each day and why he had so much fear and why he was so strict. And we didn't know anything about the day-to-day goings on his police work when we were kids. And it wasn't until college, law school, those years that we learn about the cases, but not in the detail where we, his life was in danger or how brave he really was. We saw the camaraderie and the brotherhood of his friends and fellow police officers. They were so tight, tighter than any other industry. And I learned about his integrity and how honorable he was. I certainly knew that as his daughter, but it was really made evident. We knew about his work ethic. We knew he was honorable. We knew he was trustworthy. We knew he was honest, but we didn't really realize the temptation and what a rare breed these police officers are in our society. Absolutely. You say this book is filled and this book is filled with stories of your father's bravery and other police officers, his unique brand of integrity that sometimes went against the brass, his intuition, his intellect in trying to solve crimes and his great passion for the badge itself and justice and his energy that he put forth in this relentless pursuit of justice that he had basically from his own volition. You talk about one of the stories in this book, and this book is filled with stories of burglary, robbery, murder, and the 60s riots, Martin Luther King, and, and beyond. Let's talk about a case that your father was instrumental in solving, and a particularly interesting case of a woman named Valerie Percy, her, her father, Charles Percy, running for the Senate in 1966. Tell us about Percy. Tell us about Charles Percy and his family and this campaign that he was involved with in 1966 and what happens September 18th, 1966. Well, it's fascinating because the murder occurred in Kenilworth and it's a very wealthy suburb of Chicago and crimes just don't occur and maybe littering or a speeding ticket, but not murder. And He was a celebrity. He was the chairman of Bell and Howell. He was a state senator and more than likely was going to run for president. This murderer, and I I asked my father and he said, this criminal, the man that he believed committed this murder, likely climbed a tree that faced their windows and spied on this family 
for weeks to know their patterns. And he was prepared. And it came down to looking at the MO. And criminals have patterns. And it was based on this pattern that I believe my father figured out who did it. And he was convinced. It remains a cold case today. But I heard through people who knew Senator Percy that Senator Percy knew about the young detective assigned from Chicago who told Senator Percy who he believed killed his daughter. And then you had the twin, Sharon, who was engaged to John D. Rockefeller III. And I think they didn't want any more publicity. Once they knew that this career criminal died in jail, escaping from jail or trying to escape from jail and dove into what he thought was a river, but it was really a creek, that was the end for the family. But on the books, it remains a cold case. Your father brings this horrifying story, horrifying for the family and, of course, for Valerie. On September 18th, 1966, he writes that an intruder cut through the patio screen and glass section of the French doors of the Percy 17-room mansion. And this is in the exclusive suburb of Kenilworth. The mother, Lorraine, is awoken by the sound of broken glass and she goes to investigate her daughter's room and and she finds a shadowy figure standing over her daughter, about 5'8", 160 pounds. And she awakes her husband, but this person gets away. And when you talked about this, how your father had solved this was right away in the autopsy, she'd been hit with a heavy instrument that left peculiar pine cone shaped dents in her skull. So your father being astute and following this investigation and in, and this book is also filled with so many fateful events where it seemed to be divine intervention to assist people of like your father in these investigations that were so important to him and, of course, to the victims and their families. But in the course of his investigation, and doggedly he pursues this, he does find that peculiar cone-shaped weapon or the weapon that produced those cone-shaped type wounds on this person's, on Valerie's head, didn't he? Right. In the autopsy room, there was a case of weapons and the handle of a certain old fashioned gun had that triangular part to it. And he asked them to take it out of the case. And I think that was the turning point. And not only that, the history of the criminal He had a contempt for the wealthy and he would put himself on even par by taking over their house, by taking their possessions, by raping, by robbing, by, in this case, murdering. And in one case, he defecated on the floor and then wiped himself and left a silk scarf there. Another one, he killed the cat and placed the pet, the dead pet next to the sleeping woman in the house. In another case, he ejaculated into a condom, tied the condom, and then put it in the woman's purse before he left after robbing the house. So this was one truly extraordinarily sick individual. These stories are filled with the connection that he has with other police officers, the trust that he has in his partners. And he has, as in the Dominique case, an opportunity to handpick his partners and his team. Right. It's very interesting in this Percy case that he was given information through another detective who had an informant. And that detective got information from that informant. But as he writes, he could not get that information verified. So he went to your father and then your father was able to go ahead and verify some of this information. Again, these stories are all filled with a combination of your father's integrity, his keen intuition, and then just some fateful turn of events that end up being a lucky thing like him stumbling into or not stumbling, but walking into the crime lab and just having a look after he had spoke with Johnson, Chief Johnson. So this is the kind of things that this book is filled with, of stories of bravery where your father runs runs into a building, 
where a woman is screaming, doesn't wait for the fire department, sometimes doing foolish things and sometimes bucking the the system that he's working in, the police department that he's working for and being temporarily demoted for his insubordination. But yet he regrets none of it because it was part of his character and part of his need to do what he felt was necessary, sometimes often refusing some direct orders to be able to pursue what he felt was necessary. Right. He had a little bit of dirty Harry in him. Definitely found that out. And part of it was luck, but part of it was talent. And he was very competent and trustworthy. So the superintendent knew that he could assign the two-man team and trust my father. And he was dedicated. I saw a lot of perseverance. He was thorough, perfectionist, high IQ, disciplined, and work ethic. And those are traits that he taught us. So he told me, he didn't give a lot of advice. And I think he was really happy that I became a lawyer because he wanted to become a lawyer, but my mother got pregnant and he went on the police force and dashed that hope. But he told me, you get one reputation in life. You don't get you don't get a second chance. So you you say that he also didn't talk about his work being as as a father. He did not bring that home, did he? Not at all. We would see him on television here and there when he made a big bust or big pinch, as they call it, but or see the in the newspaper. But we didn't know the danger he was in. He was a police officer. He also remarked, and it was interesting how he also talked about it in the book. The public association with the police department is usually traffic stop. And that's their only connection or what they see or their only interaction with the police. And he said, it's really a shame because they don't see the detectives, the sergeants, the commanders, and all the work that goes into working a homicide case or a robbery or is seeing how the victims and their families are so appreciative of the hard work and the dedication of those officers. And the patrolmen are certainly, any traffic stop could wind up being their last. And they are certainly working hard. But he did comment, it's unfortunate that the public doesn't see the other work that the police officers are doing uh, to solve crimes. He writes about many of the cases that he was involved with and and talks about the th- kinds of things that police officers see sometimes on a daily basis, working in robbery, working in a big city, working when murder rates were very, very high and crime rates were at their highest without the police having almost any semblance of technology in order to assist them. He talks about employing that camaraderie between police officers and how they cope with some of the trauma, like some of the things, seeing a person blown, his face blown off, his body, a headless corpse. And this book is filled with those kinds of things that a police officer, whether a veteran or a, a novice, would have to experience those things. And then after, decompress and recover from that. And your father talked about the ways police officers did do that. Yes, they had each other. And only, that's when he said, only a cop can understand another cop. That tightened the bond between them. And most of his friends were fellow police officers, detectives that worked for him, worked with him. And he really had a team approach. He didn't act like a boss. and And he really taught us that. They were a team. And once when he had back surgery and he was on painkillers, I decided to venture and ask him a question. What was the toughest case you had to solve? And he said, oh, that's easy to answer. No head, no hands, no feet. And that was the case you mentioned, the Tropicana Hotel. And I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it's mentioned in the book. And maybe he was maybe he was trying to protect somebody from making a mistake on the crime scene. But first they found out who the murdered person was by locating his car that was left parked on the street. Okay. But how did they catch the murderer? There were wine glasses. So the woman wooed the murderer into the hotel room and the boyfriend or colleague, her colleague was there waiting to murder him. And I 
think it had to do with drugs. And there were wine glasses and from the prints on the wine glasses, and I don't think that was in the book, they picked up and it led to the murder, the arrest and conviction. Fascinating. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor, which is ZipRecruiter. You know, a person that is essential to me feeling good every day is my massage therapist. Without my massage therapist and weekly massages, I wouldn't be able to function properly. And I'm very grateful to be able to have her as my therapist. We can also be grateful for those who make our work lives easier. That's why it's so important to have the right people on your team. And if you want to hire these people for your business, you need ZipRecruiter. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. Additionally, ZipRecruiter has a complete suite of tools that make it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates. So if you want a stress-free hiring process, trust me, you'll be so thankful you tried ZipRecruiter. Just go to our special URL to try it for free, ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R, ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, when we last left off, uh, we were talking about the cases that really struck your father as extraordinary, and those are the ones that are included in this incredible book, Sarge. Cases of a Chicago Police Detective, Sergeant, 1960 to 1980. One of the cases that affected him the most, and it is testament by the coverage that he does, the the amount of detail that he goes into in this particular story titled The Three Musketeers. First, tell us who these three musketeers are, and at least tell us about The Three Musketeers before we start. They were, they were detectives that my father respected and enjoyed working with because they were intelligent, dedicated, loyal, hardworking, honorable, and they had the same traits that he had. And another trait that I, I left out, I think that police officers are pretty non-judgmental because they see, they see the fabric of the life where these people are situated. And he saw both sides. He saw criminals who were kind of good guys, and he saw some cops who kind of weren't good guys. So it just leaves you non-judgmental. It's very, very similar to handling divorce cases like I do. You just you're non-judgmental. You just take it where these people are at and you go forward with it. So I have the pleasure of meeting Mr. Nolan and Mr. Ropel who were part of the Three Musketeers. I was probably much too young. And I know that we lost Mr. Nolan at a very early age. Right. Your dad writes that a long nightmare began half an hour before dawn on Saturday, November 8th, 1975, with 19-year-old Carrie Barnes. She was out at a bar. She bumped into an acquaintance of hers, Mike Butch Brooks. Um, she left this bar and noticed a strange looking man behind her and thought she was being followed, had that feeling. But then when she got right up to her home, there was a man with something in a paper bag and he was asking for directions. She thought maybe he was drunk, but then he said, he, hey, you want to be nice to me? How about a blow job? So she was angered and said, why don't you go to on Howard Street and look for it? And then he said, I want to want a blow job. I, he got aggressive and said he wanted to have sex. And she said, if you don't leave, I'll call the police. Regardless, they he pulled a blue handle that was protruding from the bag and said he was going to kill her. And then he drew it. What this was, was a hatchet from the bag. She panicked and ran. And then he attacked her in this hallway, took the light, took the light bulb out. So it was, it was dark to assist him and hacked her. With this hatchet. Right. Tell us a little more. He was merciless. He went for her face and there were 13 blows ultimately with this axe. And then 
left her for dead and raped her. And somehow she was able to push a button and get her mother's attention or her sister. Her eye was out of her socket. It was, it was brutal. Absolutely brutal. She tells police because police ask if she knows who her attacker is. And she says, who? Who does she tell police attacked her? The boy she was at the bar with, but it wasn't him. And later on, she didn't even remember saying that, which when my dad interviewed Butch in his heart of hearts, he didn't think this guy was the guy who did it. He had no reason to attack her like he did. And that's what, and that really sparked my dad into action because what he believed was this innocent man in jail. There was someone out there who was committing these crimes and who was going to do it again. And he did. So again, my dad looked for the MO. And it wasn't just like in the other case, just like in Percy, when the informer or the police officer who had the informer, they trusted my dad. And that's earned over many years. And then here we are back to reputation that he could handle it. He could take it to the next level. He could solve the crime. And he did. So, yeah, you you write that he took it to this Lieutenant Gallat and Gallat listened to him in earnest to what he had to say uh, regarding Brooks's innocence and also that there was someone else responsible completely. And this looked like he had said like the beginning of something, like a series of things. Again, the serial killer, the even the word series associated with serial crimes was not coined as of yet, was it? Right. Carrie had been struck eight times on the top of her head, 60 uh, and five times in the face. Uh, She would recover, but remain disfigured for life. And she was in a coma for several days. And uh, they asked her if she wanted her dead eye to be placed in the socket or an artificial one put in. So with this, the confidence of Lieutenant Gallat, and there is a felony review system What happens in terms of persuading and getting enough evidence to be able to be able to collar this person? Well, thankfully, Lieutenant Gallat trusted my father and allowed the investigation to continue. And they drove around the area knowing that this could happen again. And when they got the call, the next attack was five days later on November 13th. But this time it was a stabbing with a hunting knife. And everyone else around my dad said, it wasn't an ax, it's not the same. And my dad matched the viciousness. And that was the connection between these crimes. And also the mention of a blowjob and that they were attacks on young women. And the weapon was with a blade and the attack on the face, the focus on the face. And then all the... They cross-checked when they got closer to catching him and they got the logs from the diner he was working as at as a short order cook. And sure enough, he was off on the dates of both attacks. And he attacked another woman, as you mentioned, Maggie Flynn. And as you say, very, even though it was a knife, there was similarities that your father recognized right away. But to his credit, even his own team of two other officers didn't necessarily agree with them, did they? That's right. But Lieutenant Gallet said, persevere and continue with this investigation. He had that kind of confidence in, in your father, didn't he? That's right. And then Maggie ultimately gave the artist rendering. And they both, everyone said he had these dead, glassy eyes. And if you take a look at that artist rendering and take a look at his Correctional picture, or it's it's the penitentiary intake photo. Yes, the correctional corrections photo. Yeah, yeah. You can you can notice notice what they described, and ultimately that helped. And again, my father saw the pattern, and these career criminals looked up were their sex offenses. This, they have a history. And when he was let out of jail or on probation, and they figured it out. And there was another attack with a knife on November 6th, 
where Dominique took her purse, but it was listed as a robbery. And that's why they didn't know about it. So this this actually started before the November 8th attack. You write of another attack with the Christine Peacher. She's a 23-year-old traveling on, on a train and she was followed from that station. Uh, again, this this, perpetra- this perpetrator carried a black attache case and no words were spoken. And then when she tried to go inside, he pulled a small axe from under his jacket and lunged at her. And she tried to fight him off and he slashed her head. Uh, she grabbed the hatchet, but he, he had done incredible damage. And then he calmly put that hatchet in his briefcase and left the lobby calmly and slowly. Incredibly, Christine survived. Incredibly, all these brave girls survived. Strength, their will. There was another attack where, no, they're part of it. He was he was drinking beer, taking the CTA 30 minutes after he attacked Maggie Flynn. And the CTA patrol stopped him and found that knife. And I think that was one of the clues where they really were on to him as a result of that. It's a manhunt and your your father chronicles every move that he and his team make. And they finally find out that from a, a parole officer that's not corrupt, he says many are, he says he found out the address or the former address, then he ends up at a flop house. And they're prepared for a dangerous individual from the viciousness of the attacks. But they bang on the door. And to his surprise, how does Robert Dominique answer the door? What's his attire? He opens the door and he's in frilly girls underwear and lingerie. So he's not so dangerous, it seems, by his appearance. Your father talks to him, questions him. Is he cooperative? Very. And it wound up being his birthday, he said. Things, everything bad happens to him on his birthday. He may have been relieved that he was caught. He asked, he wanted to talk about his problem. He asked to talk to your father and the others about his problem. What did he say his problem primarily was? He was abandoned. He was cast away. He was institutionalized when he was 13. He hated his mother and... All the attacks on women, he pictured and visualized his mother and wanted to just hit their face and destroy them like he thought she destroyed him. And yet in other moments, he would say she was the only one that protected him from his aunt who was mean and his stepfather who rejected him. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. You talk about his abandonment. Your father writes about his abuse that he claims and that he hated his mother. His mother put him in in an institution when he was 13. And he said, I don't know how much you can believe, but like your father had said, he believed it, is that they said, we're not putting you in an institution. We're getting rid of you. So he stayed in that institution, he says, and was abused and learned to do sexual favors for money, he said, in that seven years in that institution. Yes. And then there was an incident at age 16 where he was raped and they denied it. He was drugged. He was anally raped and required stitches in his anus. And yet they continued to deny he was raped. Dominique, when he was talking to your father and the other officers at some point asked, because he seemed to figure out that the women that he attacked weren't dead. And he was surprised, wasn't he? Yes. The thing that fascinated your father greatly was the idea that this was such a vicious killer, but he was such a polite and seemingly calm, polite individual. Again, I say polite, but he was very uh, confused with this dichotomy between the two characters, the viciousness and this contrite and polite criminal. Polite, yet he never showed remorse. No. Your father worked on this case, and at some point, 16 years later, I believe, he writes, he was interested in interviewing Robert Dominique again. Why was that? And tell us more about this interview. I think this case haunted my dad. He And like you pointed out, he couldn't understand that dichotomy. And like he said before, he was fascinated by the criminal mind and... Now he had the time, the wherewithal, and by writing the book, wanted to 
understand all of it a little better. How did this man come to being to be able to act like that? What happened to him? And he was very calm and thorough in the interview. And just like a deposition, you get more bees with honey. Mm. And even though my dad didn't go to law school after hearing that interview, and of course I heard it after he passed away, I was very proud of him. He conducted himself like a lawyer and he didn't put an answer into the question. He asked an open-ended question and let the answer be the truth and whatever the answer really was. And it really is a fascinating interview. I hope that you'll listen to it. Absolutely. He was only sentenced for the attack of Maggie Flynn, but yet he was given deservedly 100 to 200 years in prison. So by the time your father went to interview him, but there was no animosity whatsoever for putting him behind bars, was there? None at all. As a matter of fact, my dad mentioned he was his first visitor in 16 years. Not one wow. person in his life had visited him. You write too that his friend, one of the musketeers, three musketeers, Paul Rappel, was, had volunteered to go with your father as well to, to the interview. Again, right. just, just curious and another dedicated cop. Yeah, it's something you can't walk into alone. Tell us more about this interview and what your father learned. He, Dominique had helped police go to all the crime scenes and gave all the details of his attacks. Very, very cooperative, as you had mentioned. What, if anything, did your father learn from this interview in terms of any kind of evidentiary value whatsoever? Well, backing up in the book, my dad mentioned that the ex wasn't in his apartment. And he said he went hunting for another woman, didn't found, find her, didn't have the right urge, wrapped the axe up and put it in a dumpster. And when they were driving around the scenes where he had committed these acts of violence and attacked women, he brought them to the dumpster. And sure enough, there was the axe. So they had the weapon that he used. And like you said, it was very cooperative. And during the interview at Statesville Prison, he was very forthcoming. There, I don't think I remember a question that he said, I don't want to answer that. Anything my dad asked, he answered and gave lurid details. And when he was, I think, seven years old, there was a neighbor down the street mm -hmm. who was I guess you'd say a pervert who would have him give him oral sex. And then he would give the boy of seven oral sex and gave him women's clothes to wear. And then when he went home, he'd wear his mom's clothes. And if the mom caught him, then she would beat him for doing that. So it was, he, he gave the details of his life that he was cast away. His father left or they divorced at a very early age. The stepfather resented him. He had a blind younger bro brother, I think. And after being institutionalized, that became his life at age 13. And he was very sexual from a very young age. And I remember at age 11, he tried to have his first act of sex. He talks about the rage. Uh, when all of the rage was released, he'd the wall would come back he'd say and he'd feel relaxed so he talks about as you as you mentioned this urge he just he said to your father in closing when he walked was walking out of the facility after the interview he called out to your father and said dimaggio if you write a book make sure you tell everyone there are a lot of lucky women out there because i looked at a lot of them but I just didn't have the urge. I know when that urge is coming. And your father wrote at that time in this book, he says if he was ever paroled, he'd strike again, no doubt. A good reason for him to stay in jail. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's fascinating that he was so cooperative. Again, each serial killer seems to have these shared characteristics. But as your father writes in this book, and shows and demonstrates that this is a very unique killer. And thankfully, he was met with your, your father and was cooperative and gave up the details. As we write, he only was 
convicted of one attack, on, even though there was four women brutally attacked and disfigured and traumatized for life. And I don't understand that, but perhaps it had to do with some of the women weren't stable enough or willing to testify because it seemed like the trials back then happened much more quickly than they do. Now. So, And I think, too, that if you look at the sentence, which was 100 years to 200 years, it looks like with that one conviction, that one, and I, I'm not sure if there were multiple, likely there were multiple charges attached to this, including attempted murder, to get the 100 to 200 years. But I think prosecutors often, it seems my experience, that they try to focus on the most provable and winnable case. And with a kind of sentence like this, it really doesn't matter. I know it will matter to the victim's families and the victims themselves. But in in judicial terms, it won't really matter since he will have an effect of a life sentence and will die in prison. Right. I was trying to think of it. It's called the correctional profile. In, and it's a 199 year sentence. I want to thank you so much, Deborah DiMaggio, for coming on and talking about Sarge, cases of a Chicago police detective sergeant in the 60s, 70s and 80s. For people that might want to take a look at this I know this book has been released in 2018 and it's all over Amazon. That's where I found it. Tell us a little bit about the Facebook page that will be up for Sarge. There's also an audio version and we won the audio book award for memoir category. And we have a company called Come Together Entertainment, LLC. It's listed under that. And there will be a Sarge Facebook page, but it's definitely on Amazon. All you have to do is go Google Sarge. And pretty proud of the cover art. Matt Devine, the lead singer of Kill Hannah, designed it. He's one of my best friends. And he did this in one take. Wow. The only change was this is my dad's original star. And we put the original on there. Fantastic. There's also... Interesting note, the Dennis Farina of Law and & Order and Goodfellas fame, there's a couple of photos where they share and embrace Dennis Farina and your father. A very interesting collection of photos as well, including your father and many other of his, his colleagues from the time of his service with the Chicago Police Department. I want to thank you so much, Deborah DiMaggio, for coming on and talking about your father's incredible book, Sarge, Cases of a Chicago Police Detective Sergeant in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Thank you so much for this interview and you have a great evening and good night. Good night. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.